Okay, once more, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the last day of our 2022 Siapu Melela Conference. There are 70 of us in the room, and uh, I suggest that we get started so that we don't disadvantage presenters in terms of uh, their time. So, yes, welcome. And um, I'm sure you have uh, all enjoyed the conference so far, which I believe had fantastic presentations in both concurrent and plenary sessions. I always find the Siapu Melela conference an extremely enriching experience. I hope you do. Today is a much shorter day than the last two days. And we will start with uh, a presentation, an institutional presentation from Nelson Mandela University. And after that, we are going to have four short panel presentations, which will be followed by a plenary discussion. And then we will hand over to Jenny and Alan to close the conference at quarter to 11. So um, without wasting much time, I would like us to get into the uh, first presentation, which will be from Nelson Mandela University. And the presenter will be Professor Cheryl Foxcroft, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Learning and Teaching at Nelson Mandela University. Before I give over the platform to her, I would like to make a, a brief introduction of her. Cheryl is a seasoned educationist and academic. She has been in the employ of Nelson Mandela University since 1982 and rose through the academic ranks in psychology to become a full professor in 1997. From January 2020, she took up the position of Deputy Vice Chancellor Learning and Teaching at the same university. Cheryl also acts as a quality reviewer for the higher edu for the higher education for the higher education quality council at the CHE and was awarded the first collaborative grant from the DHEAD for a higher education leadership development initiative that is run in conjunction with the University of Bath. She has widely published in education, particularly in the fields of student access for student access for success and psychological assessment. The assessment textbook that she is lead editor of is prescribed for professional examinations that are conducted by the Health Professions Council of South Africa. I will not take much of her time narrating her educational achievements. This morning, she will be presenting on the topic, promoting student success at Nelson Mandela University. Cheryl, you will have 20 minutes of presentation and then we will leave uh, some bit of uh, time for questions and answers. Welcome to the conference and the platform is yours. Great, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I've actually stopped putting dates on things these days, especially when I talk to students and they read the bio sketch because I realize some of them probably didn't, their parents weren't even born when I was um, a student and starting lecturing. The colleagues, it's really wonderful to, to be with you today and to just share a few thoughts with you from the university and the work that's being done to promote student success, particularly the initiatives that link to the Siapa Malela project. And it's so great to have members of SADI, the various universities that are part of the Siapa Malela network here today. Um, really great to, to see a lot of the names and even if I can't reach you all in person, please feel greeted. So what I, 
was mulling about in terms of this presentation, um, and it has been compiled by a range of people whom I'll thank at the end. But I was thinking a lot about the fact that we've been busy with preparing for the institutional audit from the HEQC, and we've just uh, submitted our self-evaluation report. And I've been reminded again about how we make um, assumptions and assertions about what we do, but is there always evidence to support that? And one of the things we reflected on is that we, we partner with students to co-create learning experiences in and out of the class and see students as important role players to take co-responsibility for their development. But now, does this actually happen in practice is the question. As you can see, um, we asked a few mentors how they define student success. And what's very interesting in these two quotes is that they see student success very broadly, becoming self-aware, understanding strengths and weaknesses, persisting towards your personal goals, taking co-responsibility to progress academically, and to graduate as a sort of holistic, responsible student. Um, and the second quote also focuses on the use of, of resources to actually grow themselves. And again, the hem themselves is not just um, academic. So that really has me thinking about a few things that I want to weave through the presentation today. Um, on the one hand, I want to talk a little bit about structures that support some of the resources available to students and then some initiatives ongoing and also new innovations linked to the Siapa Malela project. And then the puzzle for me is what we report on when it comes to student success. And I'll say a little bit about that and then where to improve and I'll try to weave data in as I go along. So as many of you know, we um, just before the pandemic struck, we had completely reconceptualized our, I guess what um, technically is called our academic development for both staff and students and came up with a whole new structure, a, a more fluid structure where there aren't centers, but they're clusters um, where we, we look at staff facing work, the yellow ones there and the green ones are, are the student facing work. And we work together across these clusters um, often in the programs that are offered and the initiatives that are offered. But what I want to focus on a little bit today is that um, in the process, we, we added our various other partners and stakeholders in the institution that we need to work with. And we particularly foregrounded faculties sort of right in the middle of the picture. Um, and what has intrigued me over the last two and a half years as this structure got implemented and we journeyed through the COVID-19 pandemic is that faculties have taken a lot more responsibility to both partner with the LT Colab, which is the, the shortened name for that longer name at the top there, um, but also to develop initiatives of their own. We just reported to council, our council yesterday and um, in the second term, the report to council focuses on student success. And so I've got faculties to, to report um, in about what they've been doing. And the thing that struck me was that the reason why faculty say they've got a heightened focus now on student success and support is that particularly in 2020, when our students were scattered all around the country and the world and we were struggling to find them, this notion of leaving no student behind seems to have stuck. And whenever I ask faculties about their work, that will always come up. So that's really been a, a for me, a, a very heartening uh, development that's taken place. Like all universities, we've got the range of support and development initiatives for students. I'm not going to speak to all of these. I know we've had presentations of some of our staff at this conference. I just wanted to pick out one or two. Um, firstly, in the, the quadrant at the top left, the yellow sort of markings, 
Um, in terms of alternative access, where we always talk about access for success as a university, we now started finding that there's been a very good throughput from the higher certificate to diploma and even degree programs. And um, it's about 4% of students that are in high, higher certificates that are moving on to diploma and degree programs. And we are finding, we've just had a study done by master's students for the um, high certificate in accounting, where it's been found that students that come via the high certificate route actually outperform those that come straight into the diploma. And there's also a better retention rate. So for us, that's a new access for success aspect that we're going to be driving much more strongly. And we have to work quite hard with NS Fuss to ensure that these students to get funded. Um, and then just the other thing to highlight in the interest of time is that um, in the bottom right quadrant, the sort of uh, blue color there, we've always had a lot of peer collaborative activities. Um, and that's been a wonderful way to support and develop. But we also introduced as part of the changes to the LT Colab, we also introduced more personal work for students um, that has a stronger academic flavor and it's not necessary uh, what student counseling would do, for example. And that we call that success coaching. And then those success coaches are also um, linked with faculty in various ways, but also faculties have um, academic advisors um, and there's close collaboration between them. So a lot more individual work is now taking place. Um, so what I'm going to just share is the five projects we've been working on with CFM Lella this year. I know that there's been a presentation at the conference about our first year success program. Just again, the balance there between what happens centrally by the LT Colab and then what happens in faculty. And we've certainly in the faculty orientation. Thinking back to those first slides where I was... Um, Using a bit about what does if, if students understand success more broadly than what do we think of in terms of our reporting? Obviously, um, using FYS buddies to offer quite a bit of our um, orientation program. If you look at some of these quotes, they learn a lot themselves and they grow a lot themselves. And again, how do we capture this um, so that they know and can prove? that they're developing in these different ways. And we also get feedback from the first years and they give positive and they give negative and we learn from the negative. Um, we spent a lot of time last year thinking about digital literacies and introduced DigiReady Buddies, which seems to have been a really good innovation to have added into the mix. And we've continued with that this year. But um, the students also worry about the fact that because there are often glitches with NSFAS funding coming through and registration issues, um, and they can't always access a laptop because we have a scheme where once they're registered, they can opt in to um, get a laptop through their NSFAS funding. But they can't always get that in time. And I know that last year in particular, when orientation was happening, a lot of students didn't ac have access to, to a laptop and so didn't weren't able to participate as well. And sometimes data then is also a problem, although we try to, to provide even non-registered first years with, with data whilst they're sorting out their problems. But then um, we just got our SASE results and um, that's the little bit, little drawings at the bottom of the screen there. Um, it was quite interesting that a lower percentage of our students in comparison to the national SASE percentage um, indicated that they they had participated in orientation. Although we thought we actually had quite a lot of students last year, but that was an interesting comparison to, uh, to add to the mix. But what we then also realized that you always have to contextualize um, what you are getting. And we, although we'd started wanting a very smooth start last year, a lot of things posed challenges at the start of the year around the late release of the metric results, around the fact that we just finished the academic, the previous academic year, 
in end of February and we're still doing some of the mop-up work when we were starting the next academic year. Um, and so it wasn't as smooth as it should have been. And some students actually joined the programs quite late. Um, and so because of that, we knew that this could impact on student success. And faculties did amazing jobs to put um, plans in place for the students that were joining late to enable them to catch up. We added a further two weeks to the semester, sort of moved the whole academic calendar on by, by two weeks. And you never know if, in fact, that's enough or not. But interestingly enough, when we, we look at the F10 results, success rates for last year, it was 85%. And in fact, for the whole university, it was 83%. So I guess that's just an example of how when you have student success uppermost in your mind and you see things that could impact on that success, you can quickly move to do something about that and then see if that's had an impact or not. Now, one thing that we've done as a university and it's part of our social justice ethos has been to, to grow the number of Quintile 1 to 3 students that in our intake. And you can see from 2010, where we had 24% quintile one to threes to 2020, 10 years later, we have now got 53%. Um, but with that comes some challenges in terms of the schooling backgrounds that the, the students have been exposed to. Many of them come from deep rural areas, coming to an urban university is already a culture shock and then we still use um, a lot of English as the medium of instruction, although tutorials are increasingly bi and multilingual now. Um, but certainly we found that, that they find it more difficult to adapt. So we've had to think through what we could do. One of those was to introduce those success coaches, for example, the more personalized work and the, the work of the advisors. Um, but talking about taking co-responsibility between students and us, a particularly passionate student who comes from the Quintile 1 to 3 schooling background actually came forward to say, you know what, these students need personal mentoring. And together with Dave Jenkins and the learning development team, a program was put together um, where senior students were trained as mentors because they themselves come from Quinto one to three schooling background. They were able to provide the more personalized attention. They know the struggles of the first years. And so they worked with um, students then who were in similar backgrounds to them. Last year, we just piloted it in the fourth term just to kind of get a feel for how this would work in the humanities faculty. This year we've expanded the pilot and it's now running for the whole year. So we're gonna get a lot of interesting data um, from that. But even the short period that we, we did last year, we've, we've got some really positive feedback from students about the, the interventions that they could be put in touch with, the fact that simple things like explaining module choice, particularly as they moved into the, the next year of their studies, um, all of that could happen and they could be motivated, et cetera. Um, so this is a very interesting project. I'm looking forward to see how it plays itself out. Um, and we're possibly looking at something similar going forward as well for some of our NSFAS students. Then it's not only students that come forward with projects, but lecturers as well. And in the Faculty of Education, we've got an advanced diploma in technical and vocational teaching. So that's to develop lecturers for the college sector. And what the lecturer noticed is that the students were struggling in terms of academic writing proficiency. And many of these students actually come in all their qualifications through the college route and some through the diploma route. Um, and so they haven't necessarily developed in-depth um, writing skills because maybe they have done technical reports, et cetera. So what the lecturer then did was to develop a project 
where firstly he got some information from students through an abstract writing task, which gave him some idea of their academic backgrounds. And then uh, students develop a journal where they get writing assignments. Um, during the time that they're doing the assignments, there's extra tutoring available, feedback, discussions, et cetera, to, to help the student get feedback, et cetera, and improve. And also our academic literacy team in, in the LT Colab work with the students. Interestingly enough, to, to give the students a longer range vision of, of why writing is so important, is that they actually have to write these assignments with the view to submitting them for publication. So they, they work with one or two journals and look at the requirements. Um, and so the hope is that that would also motivate them to realize that maybe they are going to be able to develop material for publication um, as they grow as lecturers in the college sector. We don't yet know um, the impact of this project. It's just started. Um, but it's another one of those really interesting projects that I think has got a lot of um, possibilities. Um, so we also work not just with projects linked to academic programs, but also beyond the classroom projects. We have a BTC program, which is a co-curricular one, where students form a community of practice, um, particularly work around coping skills and enabling them to unlock their creativity and their independence, um, which contributes to our graduate attributes, for example. They report on things like they learned a lot about exploring their careers and the workplace. They're better able to understand human and cultural diversity because they work in small groups and they're very diverse, but they also often work in community settings on projects, which adds to the community, the diversity. And then they learn a lot about communication. And so again, the question is, how do we make sure we re con constantly report this type of information alongside um, the other information in terms of understanding student success more broadly? So I'm getting close to the last project now. Um, th this is just the latest SESI findings from the um, financial stress scale. And the interesting thing about this drawing, you don't have to worry about all the little um, writing here, but the red bars are Nelson Mandela University and the blue bars are the SESI overall results. And if you look, the red bars are always taller than the blue bars. So our students are quite stressed financially. And on the one hand, they worry about food insecurity and money to buy food, et cetera. And I'll come back to that one just now. But what also struck me is um, the bottom set of, of results, where 62% of first years say they actually can't afford to, to buy learning materials, and 70% of seniors say that. And so we've been tracking the statistic, and I know that Gino Franzmann and his team have shared at the conference around the open ed influencer work that's being done, um, where we we train students up as ambassadors who then are able to motivate for um, motivate other students to introduce them to online educational resources, but also engage lecturers. And um, as the student on the right says, um, she learned a lot about the inequality in access to resources and sees the potential for OERs to bridge that. So this year, sorry to interrupt you, Prof. If you could I'm wind winding up in the next two right. minutes, or so. you. right. I'm winding up. Thanks. So this year, in any case, we've started an open textbook project. We've been working with UCT. We like their model, um, and we're going to start trying to encourage more and more academics to be developing open textbooks and working with other universities that are doing similarly. So, so as I sort of move to conclude. Whilst we report on success rates and that links to academic performance and we can nuance it in various ways, break it down by population group, gender, et cetera, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about how we are going to, if our students understand student success holistically, then how are we going to um, capture better the, the other things that they're developing, the things that are not easily 
um, measurable. They can be measured, but to do that would be a major task. And this is just an example of um, Francois and his team from the UFS ran that survey on, on learning materials um, in 2020. And we analyzed the data separately and then focused on what they said they'd learned and gained during the pandemic period. And this is wonderful information and we need to find ways, I've already spoken to, to some of our people about finding ways to, to more holistically then report on student success so that we don't just have part of the picture and track that, but we also track these other developmental aspects for students. So let me stop there, um, colleagues. I just want to, as I end, I'm gonna skip that one slide. I just want to put up on the screen all the different contributors to this um, presentation. Um, Kim Elliott is from the BTC, Duncan from the First Year Success Program, Gino with all the open initiatives he works with, Dave Jenkins holds the whole learning development um, section of, of LTCO Lab together and so on. Um, Lucky is the lecturer that was involved. Um, and then Charles Shepard always helps us also with data and so on. And lastly, Elmin Waring and Tar Taryn Pretorius helped to put the presentation, make it nice and smart. So thank you very much colleagues um, for this opportunity to share. Thank you very much Cheryl for sharing the excellent work you are doing at NMU. We still have about two minutes for this session, please. Any questions? You can either uh, write your questions in the chat space or you can raise up your hand and you will be able to speak. I don't seem to see any questions in the chat space. I can see only positive comments. Incredible presentation, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl, for presenting a holistic picture of student success. And some more are up there, I think. Thinking critically about our learning spaces and humanizing our pedagogy, some of my takeaways from the presentation. Wow, great. Ephraim Bala's hand is up. Bala, please unmute and speak. Uh, thank you, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, I, I enjoyed your presentation as usual. Uh, and I think uh, what I wanted to ask you is, is the issue of, of uh, your students uh, undergoing financial stress. Is it perhaps when you compare with the national averages, is it perhaps because of your higher percentage of students from quintiles one, two, and three. Uh, would that perhaps play a role? As well as the fact that, you know, that area of South Africa is also somewhat, you know, uh, under-resourced in many, many respects. Yeah, thank, thanks, Paula. Definitely, um, as the percentage of, of students on NSFAS has also increased at the university, I think that's been linked, but definitely the quintile one, two, threes. But I guess the point I, I should have made is that the other aspect of talking about student success, if we're going to talk holistically about it, is how we actually assist in addressing those basic needs of students. Um, you know, we've now, we've only got 4,000 beds on campus, but we've got 12,000 students in off-campus residences. Um, but that's not even enough. And then it's about the food insecurity, it's about the money for transport, et cetera. So these days I would say you cannot talk about student success without also having very intentional programs in place and partnerships with other groups to actually be able to address these basic needs of students. Because I think that's why their stress is so high. They're just worrying about everything under the sun because they can't afford food and they you know, they've got to look after families as well at times. Um, so yeah, so it's a big issue. I think that I know we've spoken about it here at Pumalela many times, but we also have to constantly 
you know, so I, you know, I, I'm sort of saying when we report on student success, we need to report on all a range of different aspects and not just be checking these success rates. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there are a lot of uh, positive comments in the chat space, Cheryl. I hope you can have time to read them. But Fine, yes, I'll, I'll respond to a few maybe. Thank you. For the sake of time, I will move on to the next session, which is our panel presentation session. There are four presenters, like I indicated at the beginning, I will introduce them as they come in with their presentations and they will come in a particular order which they already know. Our first presenter is from Nelson Mandela University and she is Lynn Biggs. Lynn is the acting executive dean of the Faculty of Law at NMU. She was instrumental in developing the risk analysis and detection to assist and retain student system, which is commonly known as the RADA system. And she will be presenting on that system. Lynn, you will have 10 minutes to present and then we will move on to the next presenter. We are expecting that uh, we will have more than 30 minutes of um, a plenary discussion after all the first, uh, uh, after all the four presentations. So please try and stick to the 10 minutes as much as you can. Over to you, Lynn. Good morning. Um, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to find out if you can see my presentation. Not yet. We see you, but not the presentation. Okay. All right. Um, let I could. I, it's, I'm not sure why it's not presenting. Um, because I have selected share screen. So I'm not too sure what the situation is. Um, Okay. All right. I'm probably yeah, just going to need to. Sorry. I have it open, so should I try and share it for you? It's yes, Dave, please, Dave, Dave, if you yeah. could. Thank you. Okay, I, it, it didn't come up on mine either. I've got it open here, but it's not coming up either. So let me just try once more and see what okay, happens. Thank you. Okay, it's rather strange. Um, okay, there we are. I think I've got it now. Can you see that? That's right. There we go. Yes, you thank just, you. Just, thank you very much, Dave. We can see the slides. We just need to put them in the slideshow mode. Okay, I think that's the slideshow mode. All right, um, while Dave's doing that for us, thank you very much. Nice. Apologies about that um, technical glitch, um, but thank picture? you very much. We can, we can see the rest of your slides on the left panel. Can you see the slides, Lynn? Are they okay? There That's we go. Fine. There we go. Okay. I have two screens open, so I've just taken the, disconnected the one screen. Thank okay. you. All right. So, um, good good morning, everybody. And and, and for the interest of time, um, sorry. Let me go through the questions that were posed to me um, by um, the Siapu Malela colleagues um, regarding this panel discussion. And and the questions posed were well, why student tracking, and some of the other questions to consider. Why should institutions make use of student tracking? How do you identify elements of student tracking system? How should a student tracking system support students to Lynn, succeed? Uh, sorry. Yes. We, we also see your next slide. If the person who is helping you can be able to correct that. I don't know how to do that at the moment. Um, Go to display settings and then change the, at the top, display settings. 
and then change displays. Either I'm blind or under more. Right at the top of the screen, Dave. Um, at the top. top. It, I've got uh, apps, it's... remote control, pause, new share, chat. I don't see display settings there. Um, well, um, maybe you can proceed. Okay, let's just talk to it as, as yeah. it is, um, because we, we are limited for time. That's right. Um, so those are the kinds of questions that we were asked to post. So Dave, if you could go on to the next um, screen, uh, screen slide, please. So at Nelson Mandela University, um, we, we looked at those various um, opportunities um, and, and there, many years ago, we actually started developing the radar system. So why did Mandela Uni develop radar? Um, and there are various reasons, and it actually started in about 2014, 2013 even, and then uh, um, you know, we were part of the Sia um, uh, uh project. Um, so some of the reasons from the lecturer's perspective was, you know, right at the beginning, it was more for visual, user-friendly, interactive ways to, to analyze data, um, you know, because, you know, information was, was considered really rudimentarily in basis in those, you know, a couple of years ago. But then as we progressed and we developed and we moved on and the system developed, you know, the, the, the main reasons behind developing radar was to track student performance. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the radar system is assessment-based info, which I'll talk to you a little bit later. But from the tracking of student performance, you know, the, the perspective of um, the approach that we adopted was to identify um, individual student um, information to personalize and to individualize the, um, in the, the, the data and um, for, for purposes of identifying specific interventions that that particular student requires and to monitor the student's performance, but not necessarily only from an individual perspective, but the lecturer could also look at a particular cohort of students um, as well as the entire class. So it's, it's Purely, it was you know a, a really focused on the particular um, student and the information relating to the individual students, and then to personalize that information. Um, the other one, one of the other reasons why we developed radar was to consider if we could identify any possible trends as early as possible, so that we didn't have to wait for assessment information before we started identifying how we could assist students. Um, on their, um, their, their journey to success. So the, the next question that we needed to consider, if we look at the top right, the elements of the system. Well, as I've indicated, the system is assessment-based and relies on the information um, that we get once students have, have completed assist, um, assessments. Um, it is also from a module view, and um, <clears throat> which means that when we land on the on the landing page of Moodle, I mean, not Moodle, so radar, it takes us to a module perspective because it's from the lecturer perspective wanting to have a look at their particular modules and students in their modules. And the other elements of the system is that it is ITS linked. Important um, indicators in the next block below, we looked at KPIs that could be developed and these <clears throat> KPIs could be developed per module, per department, per school, per faculty, and very individual approach that, that the, the lecturer could consider, the department could consider, the faculty could consider. It's also could link to Moodle on the student dashboard, which we'll talk about later. Um, and then, but there are also limitations of pulling data in from Moodle. Um, and this is particularly a developmental area that us at Mandela Uni are, are considering. Um, the, the how to support student success, well, the approach from the radar perspective is that it's, very, it's an extremely individualized and personalized approach for student success. Um, and then, of course, the processes to support students and fa faculties. We have, as um, Prof Foxcroft indicated, the various projects that are going around 
um, that we have on at Nelson Mandela University, which we also, with regard to radar, we have the success coaches, we have pulled in information from the Emton Jenny Wellness Center, the LSE checklist, and then of course, crucially important for, for any of these student tracking um, systems is we need RCT support um, for the ongoing maintenance, for the training of staff, and of course, for the continuous development um, of, the, of the system itself. So if we quickly just, I'm gonna quickly just show you what the radar system quickly looks like. So Dave, we can go on to the next one. This is the landing page. As, you, as I said, it's, it's module specific. You land on the page, you, um, the lecturer will have access to the modules that they present, um, type in the module code, you can select the year um, for the particular search, and then the information pops up. You can see that there's space at the top that talks about graphs, the particular graphs that are available. It can be your, your um, class average information, and there's graphs relating to tests, um, assessment uh, data over various years, what the, um, what the averages are. Um, there's also a graph for the, the different home, lang the home language graphs. And the one is the home language that the students have indicated on their registration forms. And the other is the home language um, su uh, sc subject that was, they did at school, um, which is an, also an, an important KPI that we consider. Um, and, and then the various, the, the lecturers can have the ability to comment about the particular module for reflection purposes, what they've done differently, um, why things have changed, those kind of things. Um, and they can also comment per, mod, uh, per, per um, student as well, but I'll talk about that soon. Um, so then you could see just the other, in the middle below the, the, the bar in the middle, we could actually identify the below where it says title, surnames, um, first name, are the list of the students in the class. Um, and you could, we can identify a specific cohort. So we could look at particular students, look at their results, tag them and add them to a particular cohort. For example, you know, we could look at, well, these students are repeat students or they are maths lit students. And, um, and then we could track and monitor their performance um, as a cohort. Um, and we could also have an email log of where we've specifically emailed a particular student and then just, it just provides us with a summary of what the email is. Dave, if you can go on to the next one, please. I've only got one or two more slides to go. Yes, this is particular information that we could then focus on one particular student in detail, for example. So in this particular student, this provides the lecturer with a, a snapshot of what the student situation is. You can see that the student's been um, part of the university on the LLB extended program since 2016. Um, the system allows us to go back to 2016 to analyze the student's data. And we can then have a look at, personally, you know, if I was the lecturer for civil procedure, I could sit down and, have, and look at, well, what are the problems for this particular student? I can see the other modules for which the student is registered and I can see how they're doing and then possibly look at, well, what kind of interventions could I suggest and recommend for the student um, in order to assist? Um, and I can see there, well, they're repeating a couple of modules and they're also not very, uh, doing too well in the other modules that they're repeating. So it's, it's a really a personalized, individualized approach that the lecturer can take when consulting with particular student. Um, the lecturer can then, you know, um, add, as I said, the, the student to a cohort and to, so that we can continue to monitor the student once the intervention, once the student has attended interventions. Um, you can see at the top of the screen, those are the different areas. I mean, I could, the lecturer could look at the class list again to go back. The, the lecturer can make specific comments relating to this student. The student won't see the comments. The, the comments would be particularly to the student itself for the lecturer to see. So that is how we individualize the information. The very next slide is um, just from a student perspective. We have also developed a student dashboard that this is for the student and only the student and only the student can see this. Um, and this will assist them in their journey um, um, for academic success because the student now can see the information in a more user-friendly way. Um, it's personalized information. Um, what interventions has the student been referred to? 
um, they can link to Moodle, um, click on in the Moodle marks at the top and it would take them to Moodle. Um, they could complete the LEC checklist, which is the learning enhancement checklist and the information would go straight to the Enton Journey Wellness Center. Their personalized timetables are available. They can have a summary of the emails um, that they have sent to and from their lecturers, particularly um, through ra the radar system. And then there's also a space for the students to reflect, to reflect on how they're doing, what they need to do, what interventions worked, what haven't. So this is also like, we could also link to the student journal, for example, that, that Cheryl spoke to earlier. So it's very personalized um, interventions. Then of course, on the left there, there are linkages to um, websites for, you know, residents, counseling, financial aid, other kind of information that is available. So um, if you go on to the next slide, which is the, the last slide, um, <clears throat> I just want yes, to indicate yes, to you. Please finish up. Can you it is the last up? one, sorry. What Thank we also you. did, um, Fox, Foxcroft also indicated that, um, you know, no student left behind and the, 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 the you know, the pandemic and the, the, the remote, um, working remotely from, from various areas. The, the university was really um, faced with the situation of, of needing to identify how we could assist the students so that no student was left behind. And we used radar in 2020 to assist identifying these students. So we had two different pathways <laughs> and ran at two different times. And you can see at the top there, we indicated um, whether they were pathway one or pathway two. Um, we could indicate whether they had completed the module or not. And we could also indicate whether the student had a device and if they needed a device. So we also made use of radar in that way, in a completely different way, and not just to analyze um, the um, assessments and their, their success rate, but also we could use radar to assist the, um, the, the university in identifying how um, we could ensure that we left no student behind um, during the COVID pandemic. Um, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dave, for sharing. Um, I'm not sure why what happened on my side. Yes, I'm not sure questions. what was happening with the controls here, but sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, well done there. Cheers. Thank, thank you very much, Lee. Um, we will have questions at the end, like I said earlier. I would like to move on okay, to thank you. Muzwandile Kumalo, who is from uh, Deben University of Technology. Muzwandile works in the Student Academic Support and Development Unit at DUT. He is a teaching, learning, and development practitioner and coordinator in that unit. He is also the project leader for the Auto Scholar, which is an application used to track students' performance and success. I know Muzwandile is a very active member of the Siapumelela First Year Experience Work Stream. And his presentation will be related to his experiences on student tracking. Muzwandile, 10 minutes for the presentation, please. Uh, thank you so much, Efrem, um, and a good morning to colleagues. Um, I rather have chosen not to have a presentation per se, because uh, I know that Prof. Randil will probably talk more on the technicalities of Autoscholar, um, because at DUT we are outsourcing um, Autoscholar from um, um, Prof. Randil. So thank you very much, uh, colleagues. I think where I'll have to start at, um, particularly here at DUT, is that we have really been um, trying to move more into intentional ways on how we are making sure that we have active and inactive actors that then enables um, holistic student supports. And one of the sort of inactive actors um, uh, in inverted commas would be the use of technology and the use of systems and processes that allows us to track students um, uh, uh, right at the early uh, sort of time and particularly right at the early sort of interventions that we then can introduce and that we can we can have for our students so the ways that we have been doing it is that we have the teaching learning and development practitioners who also then do academic advising work uh, but also very importantly the auto scholar project has also been rolled out to um, lecturers as well 
who then would be able also to be able to track how their students are doing academically and how then they can support. And I think uh, also a new feature that has recently been introduced into the auto scholar um, sort of application is that that which then allows also students to also track their own performance as well. One of the, I would say, stigmas that have been attached, particularly with the project when we started it and the ways then that we are communicating with, with students. And I think this would build up to what Lynn was uh, 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 alluding on uh, in her presentation, particularly around the sort of perceptions and the sort of stigmas that um, the project itself, if not well monitored, could then send out to the students. So the biggest one has been that with the interventions that we have been providing them to the students, because it has mainly been used to track student academic performance. And so what we have learned is that um, it was difficult then for us to get a hold of the students so that we can intervene as early as we possibly can when we have identified uh, the student as an at-risk kind of student. But also, I think what I want to allude on is the ways then that we are communicating, particularly um, the levels at which we are, we are in intervening to uh, our students and how then we are communicating with them to say, uh, this is where you are and this is what the system is telling us, particularly around your academic performance and how then can we help. And I think at, right at that point in time, there would be also an element of the students then saying, but I did not, uh, and I do not see that I'm, 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 I'm not performing well because yes, I am getting just over above the past mark and whatsoever, but um, the ways that we are communicating with students, colleagues, it should be in such a way that it really is inclusive and that allows and sort of brings the student into the picture of exactly what is it that we are aiming for as a university and to what really we, are we driving them. Um, the second point that I want to speak on is around the holistic nature of how the system actually helps us. Uh, and I'm sure Prof. Randil will talk briefly about how then the system also enables students to see and also staff again uh, to see how students are also demonstrating the graduate attributes as well and how then the system actually is able to track that and to see if this is um, sort of inculcated in what we call holistic student support, which is which extends beyond just the student marks, but also it speaks to how the students themselves are behaving and how involved they are even in other projects. Um, one of the downfalls of the of the project or rather of the app that we are, we are using is that we often have to wait until marks are uploaded on ITS. And sometimes this makes it um, kind of lagging um, for us as the teaching learning development practitioners to be able then to kind of intervene as early as we possibly can, because we mainly are dependent on where the lecturer is um, uh, and, and if the lecturer would then be able to upload um, the student marks on time and if it would then give us enough time to intervene right before students can even be involved in uh, or, or, or even take up exams because the idea is that we need to intervene as early as we possibly can. And so um, we often then have to be more generic and, and more sort of uh, group kind of oriented uh, in the way that we are providing our, 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 our interventions to students to say, these are the trends for the previous years, particularly around this particular module. And these are the kinds of helps that we, get, we can actually offer to the students, which would include tutorials, which would include academic advising work. And then hopefully then as soon as a lecturer um, uh, would upload the marks and then it will give us a sense of where students are in terms of their own performances individually. And we can then use that to actually uh, uh, intervene and help uh, the students. So I think that has really been one of the sort of disadvantages of the system in such a way that uh, it really is dependent on the academic staff and it's dependent on um, how well responsive they are in the ways that, and how quick they are in the ways that they actually are uploading the student marks and uh, allowing us then as the teaching learning development practitioners to then be able to intervene and to help students in the ways that we, we, we're supposed to do so. Um, 
what should be involved and what should be included in the tracking systems. Um, I think I would speak, I'll speak mainly around the idea of holistic student support. Uh, in a sense that I think for many universities, and I think few, few universities are doing this already, but there's less of uh, recognition and, and sort of ways of how we are tracking the student involvement in core curricular programs, which then we would hope that um, with those core curricular pro programs, they actually are aligned very well with the academic courses that the students are doing in a way that whatever skills that the students are learning in those particular programs would then be enacted and would ultimately enhance the success of our students. So the point that I'm trying to drive home is that sometimes, yes, students are involved in many other programs uh, within the university, particularly core curricular problems, programs, um, but there's less of recognition and less of sort of tools that we are using in how exactly and to what extent would these programs actually enhance the student academic performance uh, and the ways then that they are succeeding holistically. And so I think we would need to include an element of that um, to sort of systematize and programmatize the ways in which we are tracking core curricular programs. And we then can easily say it actually is contributing to the success of our, of our students in um, ways that are actually beyond just the classroom but in ways also that speaks to the kinds of attributes that students are demonstrating and also um, depending on how we are defining student success to also speak to those attributes then that speaks to the element of uh, students having uh, ways in which they actually can recognize and can see what other skills beyond just the academic work they actually have acquired throughout um, their academic journey. Uh, thank you so much, Ephraim. Um, back to you. Thank you so much, Mzwa, and thank you for keeping within the 10 minutes. Um, we will move on to our third presenter, who is Rande Rawatal. Randy is a professor of chemical engineering and an architect of the Autoscholar Advisor System. The Autoscholar Advisor System is an artificial intelligence-based system which has been implemented at four institutions in South Africa for supporting students' progression towards graduation. So Randy will be speaking on some of his experiences along the way relating to students' tracking. Randy, 10 minutes for your presentation, please. Thanks so much, Ephraim. Um, please tell me, is my uh, presentation showing and in the right mode and all that? We see, yes, thank you. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. So implement incremental improvements and what sticks. Uh, so uh, looking at what really works, right? So one of the things I want to say in this presentation is over the years, we've built quite a lot of functionality into the Autoscholar and it's been partly things that people have been asking for. And it's been also things where we were just pursuing cool ideas. And in part of this, we are looking at what among those things have stuck and maybe the types of things that, uh, that stick. And uh, one of the things we often talk about uh, in the Autoscholar is the artificial intelligence and uh, the high level analysis and so on. But actually, if you look at some of the things that have really stuck, some of those have relied on just very basic statistics. Some of the strongest influences are from very subtle interface design and quite often a very accidental interface design. So sometimes you have aspects of nudging uh, whether or not you intended to have those. And in some kind of disappointing cases, some people have, uh, have said they, uh, they use the Autoscholar just because there are fewer clicks uh, that they needed to do uh, in comparison with using something else. And so uh, sometimes you're trying to convince people, but the AI is there and you can do this and, and all these other things. And no, nope, the fewer clicks, uh, that, that's, what, uh, that's why I use it. And so among all these things, uh, we try to figure out what works and, and how have people been using it. Quite often, uh, people using the system in unintended ways. And through all of that, through these years of accumulating functionality into the system, um, what we've had to do is partition it. 
So it accumulated so much functionality that we, it became this uh, kind of intimidating thing. And so what we've done over time is partitioned it into these clearer use cases. And that's to look at the different types of role players. So you have lecturers teaching in courses. Uh, of course, you have students as central to the whole enterprise. There are aspects where deans are more interested. Uh, there are research aspects, especially in institutional research and so on. And so you have these different role players and they have different motivating drivers. And so sometimes your analysis might be the same, but you have to present it in different ways uh, among these different people. And if we look at, for example, lecturers, and let's look at it from the perspective of uh, lecturers, the 99% who are not coming to Siapumalela and who are feeling harassed and overworked and they don't want to hear about something that might be like a big brother or there's an, in, an extra interface to work with. So among these lecturers, um, you really want to show that you are able to make life easier and that it aligns with things that they are interested in doing. So for example, if we look at advising students, so identifying students uh, at risk, and of course, our UWC colleagues and Sue Patra will say, don't call them at risk. These are high priority students and so on. So uh, that's there. Um, so among these, uh, we want to be able to identify these high priority students uh, more quickly and easily. So that does that here. And then we ought to generate a message to the students. And so the lecturers uh, can more easily connect with the students who uh, may need more support in, uh, in doing better in the coursework. Um, so that's one. And we try to design it so that it's possible for people to customize the messaging and all of that. And quite often what comes back with is, no, just give us a single button and it must send out all the messages to all the students immediately. Uh, we're not interested in customizing it. And so in terms of what sticks, one has to look at making it that easy for people to use. So you want to offer the ability to customize as much as possible, but also sometimes you try to make it such that with uh, the click of a signal button, people are able to get to what they're looking for. Um, then here's another example where we started out designing a system for one application and it turned out it had a more interesting application somewhere else. So when we started out looking at cum laude tracking, right, we wanted to know which were the high performing students uh, that we wanted to keep on a high performing trajectory. So we were able to adapt the system to find those high performing students for us. And it gave us extra advising about how we should advise them further and all of those. So that's what we started doing. Then we thought, hmm, which are the students that are not performing that have just missed this criterion as being high performing? And what are the reasons around that? And then that gives you some insight into the curriculum further. But beyond that, we started looking even further there and thinking about, well, which are the students that are nowhere near as high performing? And how can we adapt this type of advising towards them? And apologies, I, uh, I don't think you can really see this, but it's showing here that the student, for example, is on track for uh, passing uh, at the third class level. And then it's uh, generating a message explaining that for the student to go up uh, to the second class level, uh, they need to accomplish this average mark in the remaining credits. So that starts to shift the advising towards, this is your current situation. How do we improve that? There's still enough time for you to improve your class of eventual degree. And so this is developed originally for people interested in IR and uh, looking at analyzing whole academic programs. But then we realized you could then port this functionality into our student central component where you are directly speaking to the students. And here it's saying to the student what we've just described, uh, you're you are currently on track to graduate with this class of degree. And by the way, I wish I knew this kind of thing when I was a student. I, I didn't really know what class of degree I was on track to graduate with. It's explaining here that you have remaining a 96 credits of opportunity, 
where you can upgrade that, uh, that class. So it tries to shift the gaze from uh, I, I must avoid failing to I can improve the way that I can graduate. And furthermore, it drills into what the student is currently doing. So it's looking at the current semester. It's saying, well, you've performed at this level in your current assessments. There are these upcoming assessments. So given that you've underperformed in these earlier assessments, and if you want to stay at that level to upgrade your class of degree, then this is what you must do in the remaining assessments. So that's working with the student immediately during the semester. It's saying you've got these upcoming assessments, try to perform at this level if you want to improve your class of degree. So behind that uh, little card there where it says improve my results, there's a the self-diagnosis tool. So you can try to figure out, is it because I'm not understanding content? Is it that I can't perform during the exams? Is it that I have uh, personal issues that need to be resolved? So as you uh, perform the self-diagnosis, then the system directs you to the right types of support. And uh, I like that term uh, that Francois used, uh, nudging. So using gamification, designing our interfaces such that it encourages particular types of behavior. So uh, this is an interface that uh, we built for the accreditation review panels that uh, for some of the engineering programs. And uh, we, we just released this to students uh, almost randomly. And then we suddenly had people uh, banging on our doors saying, well, I only had that mark for this reason. And, and so that's, that's all to say it's possible to create interfaces that students are very sensitive to and you can harness that energy for, um, for doing better academically. So nudging students, and that's uh, quite a powerful way uh, to, to connect with students. But of course, there you have to be very careful that you are encouraging good academic behavior. I mean, that's um, right. Thanks, uh, Ephraim. So in terms of the advice uh, that I've received over the years, um, number one, don't become cynical, right? Appreciate the small shifts in, in results and attitudes. And so, like I mentioned at the beginning, when working with large groups of lecturers and, and trying to, uh, to get them to apply different methods, uh, the shifts happen slowly, but they happen and, and you keep at it. And uh, Tim Rennick, uh, uh, one of the things he said to me was, expect the changes to come incrementally, right? Don't expect to jump straight to uh, the 50% the improvement in pass rate, for instance. So if you look at the graphs he shows, he shows these incredible shifts in their graduation rates. But if you look on the x-axis at the number of years it's taken to get there. So they've committed to 10 years of two and 3% improvements each time. And so those incremental changes, those add up over time. And that's where you have to be willing to uh, review your methods, the things that people are not using, be willing to let those fall. Maybe they're not, uh, maybe they need more revision. And so keep working at it and keep uh, trying for those incremental changes rather than seeing a large and, and sudden jump. Um, then also, it's been great on this conference. There's been so much to learn. People have shared so generously. And I've been thinking about a number of things, like um, if we could combine this kind of advising with, uh, with chatbots, and there's lots of potential there. Um, I think also we can't only look at data analytics. I think at some stage, you have to start looking into the content. And I think uh, the potential for connecting OER and, uh, and directing students in the right direction, there's a lot of potential there. So thanks very much uh, for listening. Thanks very much for the platform for us all to share. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Randy. Last but not least is Kevin McLaughlin from the University of the Witwatersrand. Kevin is the head of the Business Intelligence Services at the Edwitz University. He is uh, very much involved in developing systems for student support in the university. Kevin, 10 minutes for your presentation, please. Thanks, Ephraim. Uh, can you see the presentation? 
we can, yes. Uh, you just have to put it in um, slideshow mode. There we go. I hope you can see it in slideshow mode. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Ephraim, and thanks to colleagues. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about student tra tracking from various perspectives. I came across some papers conducted by uh, Dr. Edelman for the United States Department of Education. And there were some comments he made that I think are, are useful to bear in mind. So he speaks about the importance of conducting research that follows the student, not the institutions, because institutions may retain students, but it's students who complete degrees. He also advocates focusing on student persistence rather than institutional att attrition. What did students do that result? What did students do that resulted in attainment? What structures of opportunity do we need to offer so that future students can follow the same paths? The study also advocates the need to look for paths rather than pipelines. It says that pipelines describe lear linear learning experiences and sequences, which are inadequate to describe student behavior with its char characteristic start stops, moving sideways down one path to another, and perhaps circling back. Further suggests that researchers avoid looking for causation along a single line of explanation, but rather allow for multiple analyses and discoveries that suggest productive routes to educational goals. So up until now, we've kind of been looking at student tracking through the various presentations at the institutional level. I think Tim Rennick, when he said, we track every student every day against 800 plus risk factors is, uh, best practice as long as we've got the su surrounding supporting processes to, to help students that are identified to be struggling. At an institutional level, we can also attract students from the, their point of initial interest to application, registration, persistence onto graduation, and hopefully to postgraduate study using systems like uh, CRM. You can track their performance relative to their cohort. You can determine their stopouts, dropouts, movement between schools, faculties, courses, and qualifications. You can use their matric results as background variables to predict success and to intervene as necessary. But if the student leaves the institution, you lose sight of them. They become a dropout and a failed government investment. If they're registered at another institution, the preceding institution institution's information about the student's performance is, is unavailable to the next institution, and the future performance information of the student is un, unavailable to the preceding institution. I've tried to deal with some of these issues with uh, so-called statewide longitudinal data systems that have been developed in a number of different states. These aim to integrate the schooling system data with post-secondary schooling data and employment data. So to produce a connected uh, education value chain with feedback loops. Despite showing promise, systems that are not at the national level, such as these systems, have se several lim limitations like the institutional uh, uh, perspective. They only include data about the state in which uh, uh, the students are located, meaning that data is missing for students that move to attend college or begin work in another state. It may prove futile to base decisions only on the outcomes of students or employees who re remained in the state. These systems are also restricted in the ways that they quantify student success. Um, the reason I looked at this from different perspectives is because of my involvement in the National Stud Student Data Warehouse uh, project funded by DHEAD. So the, the National Student Data Warehouse will enable us to overcome the limitations inherent in ins, institutional tracking systems um, and systems like the statewide longitudinal data systems. With the implementation of the NSDW, it will be possible to track individual student pathways to success at the national scale and to identify, promote, and support patterns that cut across faculty, program, institution, and method of delivery boundaries. The NSDW will enable us to look broadly at the national picture rather than just the institutional or regional perspective with the blind spots that I've spoken about. Student crosses institutional boundaries in pursuit of success. They're not lost from view. Their whole history from a trick to higher education and their movement between institutions is recorded. 
This will allow for any patents uh, to emerge to be, that can be investigated, understood, and supported as ne necessary. The NSDW will enable us to focus on the individual student rather than just on the institution, and to focus on persist persistence rather than just on attrition. Dashboards will be developed to support this kind of tracking to enable institutional stakeholders to monitor and track pathways to success that tra traverse institutional boundaries and to understand where their students have gone and whether they have been successful. This is obviously dependent on DHEAD governance and access to the data. Members of the community will be invited to make comment and will be trained to use the system. Thanks, Ephraim. That's my last slide. That's great, um, Kevin. Thanks very much. Um, it, that leaves us with um, about 28 or so minutes, if I'm not mistaken, yes, until quarter two, in which to ask questions and, and comment on all the four presentations. I would like to say that, yeah, there are certain things that we are hoping will come out of this session. And one of those is how, how we address um, certain key questions relating to um, tracking, tracking of uh, students and students' performance. I, I, I just like to flag some of the key questions that I'm hoping that we will be able to answer through this session. Some of them might have indeed been answered through the four presentations. Others, we might be able to answer through this discussion. I've, uh, I've put the five questions in the chat space, but I will read them quickly. The first question we hope will be answered through this session is, why should institutions make use of student tracking? Why is it important to do that? The second one is, how do you identify elements of a student tracking system? And the third one, how should a student tracking system support students to succeed? And the fourth one, how could one include important indicators and the learning management system data in a student tracking system? And the last one is, what processes could be used to support students and faculty to use a student tracking system? So in our discussion, we are hoping that um, we will be able to get answers to some of those questions. You are also free to ask any questions you have and to give any comments that you may have on the presentations. So the floor is open for questions and comments. If you have any question, please raise up your hand or post in the chat space. I don't know, Fatima, if there are any questions that have been posted in the chat space so far, which I might have missed. Any questions? I don't see any hand up. Any comments? There are comments that are coming in. I found there's a question from Ashton regarding the National Student Data Warehouse. When is it expected to launch? That's directed to you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, the design has been completed. The funding has been secured. The issue at the moment is that uh, the Department of Higher Education and Training and the Department of Basic Education are trying to engage with the Poppy regulator to get uh, permission to share the data. So once that once that issue is resolved, and Sadie's put a lot of effort into helping to unlock that, uh, we we can move ahead. Um, it's a two year two year project. Once we get the go ahead. And there's another question from Cool regarding the range of student data that will be housed in the in the data warehouse, if you could comment on that, and also how will Papaya be handled regarding this data? 
Yeah, so the range of data is it will be a decade's worth of the data collected via HEMIS. Um, uh, you know, that's uh, currently housed in a silo at the at DHET, and also um, the decade long of NSC data collected by the, the Department of Basic Education, and that information will be integrated. So the metric information will be integrated with the subsequent years of matching HEMIS data. Um, as I said, we're waiting for a way to uh, get the go ahead from the poppy regulator on this. Great. Ram, can we take some more questions? Yes. Because there are more and on the chat. There's, there's a, a hand up I can see from Percy. Yeah, sure. So maybe mine is just a comment um, about the National Student Data Warehouse. Um, it's nice to have these data uh, uh, bases, but I think what is always missing is um, a database which uh, uh, keeps a record of all the research that has been done using this data in one uh, specific source. So I think maybe very linked to this um, would be uh, where people could, like a Dropbox where I could drop my research that, uh, that I've published using the specific kind of data. That's a fantastic idea. The platform, the National Student Data Warehouse platform, one of the key reasons for it is to promote uh, educational research and having a quality assured integrated data set cuts down on the work that has to be repeated every time research is done. So it should uh, really help such research to flourish. And to have one place to, to house it would be great. So we will bear that in mind. Thank you. Great. Ephraim, there's a question from Carleen that she's posted twice now. Uh, it's directed at Ms. Wandile. She talks about bringing in the student perspectives and how they interpret and value their own success. And the question is, do you advise them in the context of enhanced performance if they wish to step up in ways like when you showed? Or which pathways do you suggest? And that's for Ms. Wandile. Okay. Ms. Wa, there is a question to you. Um, you are muted, Ms. Wa. Ms. Wa, you are muted. I'm sorry, I'm battling to unmute. Uh, I don't know what is wrong with my system. Yes. Um, the biggest one we, we we always have to make sure that it's more on the positive side, the way that we are doing it. So in the ways that we actually are advising our students, we want to make sure that they also are part of uh, their own development, but also they identify areas to which we can actually develop them. Because this extends just beyond, you know, uh, the deficit approach that we may we, we, we may automatically take in the ways that we are uh, uh, advising our students. So there's, I think my shift and my focus now is always on the, the positives to look into what strengths that we actually can use for the students for them to improve their own success. But then also to not only focus on those that are really struggling or that uh, those that are differently pre uh, prepared, if I may put it in that sense, uh, because I don't like using the term underprepared, but to make sure then that we use their own ways of knowing, their own ways of understanding things in order for them to be enhanced and to be improved in the ways that they actually are performing academically. Uh, thanks, I hope that answers your question, uh, Kalin. For sure, thank you. Good. Great. Uh, Bala, you have your hand up, please unmute and speak. Thank you, uh, Chef. Uh, can I get back to student tracking? Uh, and and I think that the you know what I'd like to to comment on is is uh, some of the attributes that we want from student tracking. Uh, one, it's got to be early warning, personalized, individualized, uh, and uh, some of the challenges that were mentioned. The challenges in terms of getting the assessments uh, early enough on the system 
uh, for analysis, uh, th this kind of uh, resistance or pushback by staff, uh, you know, wanting to uh, basically embrace it or wanting very simple functionalities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, taking all of that into account, I think that's important, you know, to, to develop these tools uh, and you can get a lot of information and the more tools we, we develop, the more information we get. I mean, it's ana analogous to gene sequencing. You know, we, we sequence uh, billions of, of base pairs today. Uh, a lot of them are useless information, but we do it nevertheless. But getting back to student tracking uh, and collection of data, for me, I think the most important thing will be from the presentations that Tim Rennick has done over the years. Uh, and unless, unless the institutions are serious and committed to, to actually looking at student support and providing stu student support from the information we get about student tracking. I, I think we're gonna be struggling to really get the kind of results we want to achieve. And, and I think therein lies the big challenge. The challenge is how much of resources can the institutions put into supporting students uh, and whether or not they are committed to do that. And unless they do it, like the model we have from the institution that uh, Tim, Tim talks about. I think we're gonna keep on struggling to achieve the success we want. Thank you. Thank you, Bala. Um, I would also like us to try and address some of those questions, the five questions that I posted in the chat space. Why should institutions make use of student tracking? And I think um, the answers do not necessarily have to come from the presenters. They can come from anyone in, in, the, in the meeting. Any responses to that question? Yes, Randy. Thank, thanks, Ephraim. Um, yeah, I think one of the reasons is to direct resources to the right places. So, at institutions, uh, there are actually many, many forms of support. In fact, there are often so many forms of support that it becomes a challenge just keeping track of them. And I know of at least one project where it's just about um, counting the number of support services available. So we have all the support and it, uh, it costs a lot in terms of the resources and so on. And to be able to direct those to the right places is key. Uh, quite often the students um, who, uh, who need support the least are the first ones to, um, to engage with them. And it's not that we don't want that. We, of course, want to continue all that advising of all students, but to be able to identify the students most in need of it and be able to encourage them to engage, I think that's where we'd start to see some, uh, some real impact. Okay, thanks very much for that. Any other response to that question? Okay. Um, yes. How? There's a comment from Ku to Mandy. Yeah. And she asks Is it possible to integrate sanitized data, such as whether a student is receiving mental health counseling, into the Class View Connect that lectures or academic advisors access for academic tracking? Mandy? Uh, thanks for that. Uh, so, Yes, in terms of, um, it, it's not so much in class view connect, uh, there are ethical issues with disclosing such information uh, to the, um, uh, to even your academic advisors. Um, in the casework counselor, uh, there is a facility to, uh, to manage your disclosure. So the student uh, decides what they would like to disclose to whom. So um, there should be some control uh, from the student side uh, in deciding uh, the level of disclosure. And, and so, that, uh, uh, so that, that needs to be managed quite carefully. Um, it may be possible, and I think this is uh, what Ku is alluding to, it, it may be possible to flag that uh, there, there are um, other concerns. Uh, so to, to kind of form, a classification or a, a, well, even using that, even saying it that way is problematic, but 
it may be possible to flag that there are uh, other issues affecting performance. I think that needs to be worked through. Uh, so all of that is technically possible, but in terms of the way we want it to, to happen, I, I think that needs a, a broader discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think that links to that second question on, on how you identify the elements of a student tracking system. How do you identify those elements? Anybody? Any ideas on that? Uh, sorry, Ephraim, uh, maybe uh, could, could that one be elaborated on a bit, the elements of student tracking? I, I don't quite get what that's, uh, that's saying. Okay. Um, when you build a student tracking system, how do you identify what that system should track? I think that's the essence of the question. I invite my colleagues like Alan to also elaborate. Kevin, Kevin respond? Yes. Yeah. You can Fred, I'm you. just gonna try and show a single slide if I can. Okay. Uh, can you see that? Yes, we can see that, thank you. So this is the kind of way that we look at it. Um, right at the center is, you know, there's a lot of hype around the AI models and so on, but that's really quite a small component. Um, we see that as being uh, importantly housed in a proper enterprise data warehouse platform, because if you don't have a way to collect, structure, quality, assure the data, your AI models aren't, go aren't going to operate effectively. Also, when you run a model, um, it tends to drift over time. So you need to be able to keep track of all of the data that's gone into the model and the outcomes that uh, were produced by the model and uh, track the, the way it, uh, the drift and so on and keep it accurate. The next thing is the processes. If you don't have the processes in place, for example, so someone spoke about um, getting the marks captured timelessly, et cetera, and getting interventions kept, uh, captured timelessly, you also don't make accurate predictions, et cetera. So to get the processes right is also a big job and it, it's not a once-off. We've got to keep um, reminding people to, to get the assessments uploaded, et cetera. <clears throat> the next thing is partnerships. Uh, none of this is done alone. It's done as a group uh, across silos, um, work, people working together. So for example, our academic information systems unit um, our um, director of academic affairs are all involved uh, on a regular basis in making this thing work. And then finally, having uh, executive support and proper governance driven from the top through the student uh, success committee, I think is a very important component. So all of these broader issues need to be brought, uh, synchronized and brought to bear to make uh, the thing work. Okay, thank you, Kevin. I see Randy's hand is up. Randy. Uh, thanks, Ephraim. Um, one of the things that we realized needed to be centralized was also the advice given to students. So quite often a student is uh, given advice according to a particular progression strategy. So for example, it might be about uh, reducing credit loads uh, uh, so that uh, the, uh, the capacity is improved, or it might be about increasing credit loads to help with the uh, um, uh, better chance to reach minimum time to grad. So there's a quite often a, a particular strategy behind uh, the advice that's given. And when that's not captured, then, it, then the student often receives conflicting advice. So, uh, so capturing the advice that's given and being able to see what has been said to the student so far. And there again, you have to be careful about um, what can be disclosed. Um, so if perhaps the strategy is shared, um, uh, perhaps the strategy can be shared more easily than the specific advice given. 
So um, maybe that partially answers Ku's question as well. But yeah, in addition to the academic side, also the nature of the advising given, I think that's another key aspect. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Randy. Um, any more questions? Any more questions? I think Kuz just also elaborating on the additional um, elements there regarding lecture and tutorial attendance. She's asking if that should be tracked, library access and usage, financial support received. She's given a host of elements there, co-curricular activities, as Mazwa suggested. So thanks for that, Kuz. Cool. Do you want to comment on that? And there's a comment from Alan, a hand raised from Alan. So. Uh, maybe Alan to go first. Thank you. Um, uh, I actually wanted to, uh, you finish talking because I want to ask another question uh, that is not in those five questions or whatever there is. So please continue now. Finish when you're finished. I will talk. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, the. The aspects that Ku has raised, uh, I would say, also fits nicely with uh, the work by NMU in uh, looking at, uh, if you look at the radar system, I think it looks at the LMS and the amount of engagement there. So uh, all the types of, all those types of data, including the list by Ku, uh, those are all important indicators about the level of engagement by students. I, I think that's key. Um, because yes, it, it is a struggle trying to figure out uh, what a, a student or the level of activity by a student during the semester. And uh, we try to do that uh, with the assessment data. I've mentioned about using the assessment data, but uh, as Bala pointed out, sometimes that's a challenge when lecturers are not uploading those results timelessly. And there are some solutions towards that. We do have a way of tracking which assessments are not uploaded and so on. Um, that's in Class View Connect, but still um, uh, these other indicators, they uh, give us more data about the level of activity and uh, possibly over time, we'll find other ways of interpreting that as well. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Alan, you can come up. Thank you. I, I actually want to change the discussion a little bit. I want to ask the participants what kind of uh, support would they need to be able to think about um, uh, in, uh, using student uh, support, uh, um, um, sorry, student tracking systems, so that we could perhaps develop a, a series of workshops that can help people. So for one, one of the, the questions you might want to ask is, uh, if I want to uh, think about this, what kind, how is the data to be structured? Before you even start using that, how, is the, the, how do you think about data? So the question that I would like to ask the audience is, what kinds of support would you think you might want that we could use uh, the, those questions and try to find ways to answer them in workshops. Is any so maybe Alan in a series of uh, service workshops. Yes, yes, not one, but I mean, there might be many. Mm -hmm. Okay, any responses? Again, Ranja, I see your hand up. So perhaps uh, what could be proposed is a, is a kind of framework that would help us evaluate uh, different intervention methods so that um, when these different solutions are proposed, then we evaluate it against the framework. So we have a way of, uh, of looking at different methods that, that are proposed by the different institutions. So lots of great ideas were proposed during this conference and in other uh, fora. So if there's a, a framework against which we could evaluate them, then we could look at more adoption and uh, 
and looking at how institutions can implement them. Okay, thank you. Any more responses to Alan's question? Uh, sorry, uh, Ephraim, I've got my hand up. Yes, Jenny. I, I just wanted to suggest that it might be useful to understand better those institutions who are, are struggling to, to do this, um, who are at early stages. Um, and so that might be a, a kind of intervention where we put on the table um, you know, what, what are the difficulties of, of getting going in, in this regard? Okay, thank you. Is there anyone from any one of those institutions who would like to give some insights on that? What difficulties do you face? I didn't necessarily think now, Ephraim, but rather yeah. <laughs> it was a process that one might go through through a, a kind of sharing workshop, um, yeah. Okay. Ephraim, if I might ask a question here. So I think this relates to a comment that Innocent put in the chat. And he asked, how do you get your lecturers or coordinators to actually capture the students' marks for your student tracking system? And I think that relates to another broader issue about relationship building, the soft skills, you know, not using buzz, buzzwords, getting uh, yeah, those other key uh, stakeholders to invest in the system. I don't know if, if that is something that the Siapo Malela team would, would, would address at any level, those type of soft skills approach, apart from the, you know, the actual data skills. That's just a question I'm posing there, following Innocent's comment. Okay. Thank you, Fatima. Um, Charles, Charles, I see your hand is up. Uh, yes, I think uh, that was also something that we struggled a lot with, but uh, you know, there's also a human rule that uh, you have to show student activity uh, to be able to claim subsidy. So we, we constantly remind lecturers that if they don't capture marks on the system, it's very difficult for us to show student activity. We, we sometimes have to uh, uh, scrap, in a sense, a lot of student registrations because there was no activity shown. And putting marks on the system is one way of sh showing that the student was active so that you can actually claim subsidy. It's a very good incentive, actually. Okay. Thank you, Charles, for that. Um, we have one minute left. I see there are two hands up. Uh, Teboko, first, uh, and thank then you. Misha. Thank you, Ephraim. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you. I think just a follow up. I think there was also a comment about uh, institutes that are busy with the tracker and some of the challenges that we face. We're actually at that stage. And I think maybe the, the answer about the framework is what will really help us a lot. But I think uh, one of the other issues that we might need to consider is the issue of also the skill set. Because I've realized that as we started, we started to ask a lot of questions. And one of them was, who are these people who are who are equipped with the knowledge to be able to develop these particular kinds of tools? We realize that the power heater can help at this to a certain extent, but we still need uh, skill sets with able to uh, work with that particular data and develop it and customize it within the particular institutes. But also, I think the other issue is the issue of data cleaning. I think one of the big uh, stumbling block for us is a uh, lack of uh, clean data. So you find the system doesn't give us an accurate information. That's beside the point of delayed information into the system because we're working with a system that feeds on what is in the database. But I think the clean data is one of the big issues that we might need to get uh, support with. I think overall, but I think the framework, if you can help us a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Tabuko. Um, we lost you at the very end. I don't know if it was me or only, or we didn't hear the very last words you were saying, but I think we got the gist of your, your idea. Thank, Thank you very you. much. The last one, uh, Venetia. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I just want to also perhaps uh, draw our attention to another factor. 
And I'm not sure if the other universities are experiencing it, which I think they would, but you have students who are totally just not active, meaning they register for the modules, uh, they register as students, but they totally don't function. Uh, and it's in all the different modules. So you have about 15 or 20% of students that are totally, so you can reach out to them. They don't submit, so there's not even a mark. If you're talking about lectures, not submitting marks. The marks that we have will be for students who are actually active and who are actually participating. But so maybe if we, I, I always wanted to start a research, you know, a research study about that. Why are there students, and it's in all levels, not only first year, who are registering, who supposedly be active, but they're not. They're not coming to class, they don't submit, and they are then the students who are increasing our failure rate. Because for me, you engage and you want to support students who are there and who are present, but as students, uh, so I'm not sure if other universities have that, and maybe we can start thinking about how can we also you know, get to those students because they don't respond to emails, they don't respond to calls, and they then make that you, your, your, your module in the end have a higher failure rate than actually the action, you know, the active students. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have come to the end of this question and answer session, but let me just entertain um, one more. I see there's a hand up, Kevin. Yeah, Ephraim, I think the issue of skills is really important because it's something we've struggled with over a long period of time. And what we've done is we've created a skills pipeline because we've got, we take the best students and I think that applies to most universities. Um, and we've got therefore the best minds on campus. So what we do is you need a core set of skills, but then you bring students in and train them, we, we bring them in twice a year, once in June, July, and once in November, December. We train them in data engineering and data science skills, and those that show capability, if we've got uh, spots for them, we either take them in while they do their higher degree studies, or we hire them. So I think that the skills issue is very important to address. There's a global shortage, and universities can do a lot to, to harness the, the best minds on campus at the moment. Mm. Thank you, Kevin, for that. I'm checking if there's a, anyone with a burning question, but I don't seem to see any. Uh, Randia? So um, this is more about the previous question about the uh, students who are not active and not responsive. Um, something that we uh, we, accept, we we sort of strayed into was nudging. Um, we found that um, when you apply uh, a certain interface styles, that um, in a way you you can create alarm sometimes, and uh, um, and and uh, students are um, are more engaged and interested. And of course, they uh, as I mentioned. You have to do this carefully. You, you want to encourage people to do the right things academically. Um, but nudging uh, definitely is a powerful way uh, to, to engage students better, um, giving them feedback on things. Uh, it comes down to subtle interface design, sometimes the use of the right colors. Um, basic things like this can actually have them, uh, you know, it's the difference between not hearing anything from them and having them uh, banging on your door to find out something. So uh, I, I think that's a, a solution. It, it's not the answer to the question. I think the question was, why is it like this? But you know, th that's a possible solution towards that. Thanks. Thanks very much, Randia. Thank you. Colleagues, thank you very much for this very lively uh, session and the debates that have gone on. Let me hand over to Alan and Jenny. Um, thank you, Ephraim. Um, please, may I check? Can everybody hear me? I can hear you very clearly. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I know that um, it, it is my pleasure to bring this conference uh, to an end. Um, and uh, thinking about the effect, certainly on me privately, and I think on many of us around this uh, table, this virtual table, 
Um, it took me back to some of, and I know many of you are too young to remember this, some of the very dark days of apartheid, especially during a state of emergency. It was really easy to be despondent. Um, and the context, our external, uh, the context was bleak. We sought comfort, affirmation, motivation from the remarkable efforts of communities of people on the ground. And that was the way to restore our energy was to engage with people of that kind. Today, I think in, in many ways, our context is equally bleak, particularly in the international, con the international context, our, our global context, and many of the things that are happening in our country. We are called to be resilient, but not only must we be resilient, we must also be energetic and move forward. Um, and this conference and participating in this conference has really been a wonderful experience, confirming a, a growing, a vibrant community, a community, as Randia has just said, has been sharing so generously and also a community that seems to be humble enough to be so open to learn from each other. This conference, I think, has shown a great deal of growing mature, uh, maturity. Um, I imagine that the partner presentations were going to be as excellent as they were last year. Well, they surpassed my expectations. So thank you to all the partners who put their effort into making these presentations and to continue uh, to ensure um, to share what they are learning with all of us in such an open way. And then truly remarkable for this conference was the concurrent sessions. Um, I was chatting with, with Alan yesterday, and I think we can, without doubt, say that there has been a quantum leap in the quality of those presentations. It was already evident from the abstracts that we received, and participating in them, and I obviously couldn't participate in all of them, but those that I chose, and I then checked with my colleagues about ones where they were, um, they confirmed my impression that almost every one of the presentations um, was a, a solid contribution to the ongoing development of Sia Pumalela. I'd love to look in the chats, to look at the words, and I can't believe how many times the word inspiring came up. Inspiring from Tim Rennick, well, we expected that inspiring about some of the partner presentations. Well, we expected that, but, some of, but also in the concurrent sessions, a number of them where people were saying, this is inspiring, great work. And can I speak with you afterwards? So the connections were, were actually made. It's also a great leap forward in this conference that I think we are moving much more uh, towards a holistic understanding of student success. The numbers, we are moving beyond the numbers. The numbers are important, um, but moving beyond the numbers, and particularly as Cheryl was outlining today, that, that is how students see student success. And I think that has emerged as well in the, um, in, in the Western Cape and UCT in particular with the sessions that they've been holding amongst institutions trying to understand what student success means. But as I said, the numbers do remain important. And one number that came through the conference this, this week um, was something that was presented by, by SASE and actually surprised me. And I asked several people what they would have guessed the outcome was, would be. And it was around the question of that students felt at least to some degree that they were valued by their institution. Um, well, most of my colleagues who I asked guessed, well, 40%, 50%. Well, in this particular case, the figure that was presented to us was 81% in some way or another felt valued by their institution. And that seems to me to be moving in the right direction. Clearly, there's still 19% who don't. And that does not go along then with a phrase that has been used many times in this conference, which is ensuring that no student is left behind. So we've got a good starting point, but we've still got some ways to go. And finally, I think this conference um, has shown in so many ways, it's given us practical expression of the saying, if you wanna go fast, go alone. 
if you want to go far, go together. So I would like to thank everybody who has participated in this conference for making that a possibility for, for Sia Pumalela. Uh, Alan is going to do some more thank yous, but um, nobody else is going to thank Alan. So I would like to publicly thank Alan um, for his tireless efforts in putting this conference together and giving shape to the various ideas and contributions that the people, people were making about um, what should be in this conference. Um, from finally getting far more um, concurrent sessions proposals that he, than he had expected and really felt that he couldn't refuse any of them. And so I had to go the extra mile and create additional concurrent sessions. Um, so thank you very much indeed for Alan, um, for your efforts over this time. You tell me you've got some more gray hairs. They're not yet evident. Um, and we wish you lots and lots of more energy uh, to continue in this work. And now I would like to hand over to Alan to thank the rest of you. Uh, thank you, Jenny. And uh, this experience of Sia Pumulela is, I suppose, always been a highlight, although it's a, 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 a putting a conference together can be uh, quite uh, daunting at times. I think it's still uh, comes to uh, support people rather than uh, thing uh, than than just being a technology kind of way of putting things together. So I want to just say to the 270 participants who joined in this conference, which is the highest number we have ever had before, thank you very much for your per persistence to get into the system and to use the system. I also want to thank all the plenary. Uh, uh, presentations who shared their outlooks and um, their uh, experiences to help us. And uh, it was interesting from starting in the beginning with uh, our friends from uh, uh, Georgia State and then having a different way of looking at the same problems, but from a completely different perspectives. And it was very interesting to have those two uh, uh, first keynotes. And so thank you to those participants. I also want to say uh, thank you to all those who participated in the concurrent sessions. And um, our techie group, Dreams, uh, uh, now I've lost my Dreams Dream. Uh, for supplying the, 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 the support for it. Of course, we have to thank the Kresge Foundation also for their uh, support. And of course, uh, I want to especially thank Bill because he's always so enthusiastic and always helping us to think about these things. We also had quite a lot of support from Achieving the Dream, so thank you to them. And finally, I do want to say to all SABI staff, but especially I want to thank Jenny, Fatima, Marilla, Ephraim, Tony, Elias, Maureen, and Humi for all their work other, uh, at the back of all of this, because without this structure, without the support, we would never be able to put this together. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, one last thing, you will be receiving a little um, questionnaire for us to evaluate what you thought about the different components of the conference so that we might change and improve. Thank you very much.